Thank you for the, the invitation. Um, um, what I want to do is talk a bit about the kind of work I've done in civil litigation cases, um, partly just to give you an idea of things that can happen, but actually I'd really encourage people to think about whether you could maybe contribute. Um, about 20 years ago, at least none of you should say before I was born at this point, unlike my undergraduates, uh, I was uh, on RSS Council and I did quite a bit of liaison um, with regard to stats and the law. I spent the last six months uh, backwards and forwards in the Isaac Newton Institute in Cambridge um, on a workshop about probability, statistics and the law. And there's been a lot of progress. There's a lot more interest. Um, that workshop focused largely on criminal law, but there is also a lot more interest in civil law. And there's an awful lot that we can contribute. Um, and part of, partly what I want to do is if you've got questions about whether it's frightening or worrying um, or anything else, I'll look forward to answering them. So in case anybody's printed it off, I'm now going to move to my slide two, just to give you a little bit more of an idea of what civil issues are, and then I'll talk a little bit about each of those cases before I sum up on some of the pros and cons. <coughs> You'll see I don't have a lot of slides. Um, I don't think there's any maths in it. Um, but there's a lot of important statistical ideas in the sense of what data do we have, what conclusions might or might not be valid. And a civil lawsuit essentially means that one party, maybe a person, maybe a group of people, is claiming damages from a second party, a person or a company or so on, or demands particular actions. They you know, on a, on a local scale, it might be, uh, please cut your hedge down to a reasonable height. I haven't got any sunlight. So the kinds of questions I've been involved in are things like, how long will this person live? Um, I started that with cerebral palsy, brain injury at birth. Um, as with so much of my career, it was not carefully planned. It was the medical head of department at the time coming in and saying, uh, would you like to put in for this little grant with me? And we published a paper, and suddenly we got a lot of interest. Um, cancer I haven't done that much on, although I have got been asked to do a case on cancer, and I'm keen that more people get involved in that. Uh, spinal cord injury I certainly have been involved in um, uh, quite, quite a few cases. That's very often road traffic accidents. Um, all of this work, of course, is really quite tragic. Um, I know statisticians might have the reputation for being uh, just interested in the numbers, but it can be pretty grim reading when you, you hear what things happen. So, for example, a brain injury at birth. Uh, most recent case, I was talking to somebody in Canada, uh, was a child whose mother had thrown him on a concrete floor when he was four months old, uh, hence uh, cerebral palsy. Then, of course, we get side effects, the association of Vioxx with cardiovascular events. Um, so this was a painkiller, a very effective non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that was eventually withdrawn from the market. Compensation had been paid in the US and the UK, but, uh, in England, but not in Scotland. Um, another case was this drug has damaged the site of my patient. And another one, if anticoagulants had been administered sooner, my patient would not have died. So I'm going to go to the slide three, which is talking a little bit about life expectancy. Um, this is a case that I actually went over to Dublin to do. It's something that I, I had thought had become rare, but has surfaced. So it still is the case, I think, that in quite a lot of medical legal cases, medical people will be asked about life expectancy. And in this case, I think it was a 10-year-old, may not have been exactly a 10-year-old girl with cerebral palsy. And the pediatrician who was giving an estimate of her life expectancy um, had used some research articles which had tables of the life expectancy for a 15-year-old, 30-year-old, 45-year-old. And her argument was that this particular... 10-year-old uh, was more likely or not 
than not to live to age 15. So she sort of invoked the idea of balance of probabilities. And then she said, well, if we look at the life expectancy from age 15, it's beyond 15 years, in other words, to age 30, so we can assume she will live to age 30. And if we look at the life expectancy from age 30, we can assume she'll live to age 45, so I'll take the life expectancy from age 45. Um, I'd always heard of this kind of procedure as, as, a, as an unkind joke statisticians told about medical people. I never expected to actually see it in court. What in fact happened was I got a telephone call from lawyers saying, we're in court at the moment and we need your help. To which the uh, consulting statistician's favorite, when did you first know about this deadline, does tend to surface. Anyway, um, I said, well, no, I can't talk to you at 4 o'clock this afternoon. I can talk to you um, if you phone back in five minutes, 20 minutes. Net result was I did some work over the weekend and flew on the, probably the Tuesday, I don't think courts are open on Mondays, to Dublin and explained what was happening. This was um, a case in which, because the case had already started, I'd seen the transcript of what the judge had been saying, so I knew that I had a very numerate, very reasonable judge. Um, so what happened is the the counsel on the side I was instructed by, the defendants, as it happened, I do both defendants and plaintiffs, um, led me through the evidence, and then the cross-examining counsel tried to imply that I got everything wrong. Um, now, of course, uh, temperament does come into to it a little bit if you're actually in court, and I think some of you might know that I don't mind a bit of a bit of verbal ping pong. So when when he was trying to demolish my evidence and say I was didn't know what I was talking about, um, I quietly amused myself because he was trying to refer to papers and he'd got lost. So I actually had to help him sort out what he wanted to ask me, which I did, of course, very politely. And of course, the other thing you do is you're asked questions from somebody standing, say, off to your right. But you have to answer them to the judge who's slightly off and above you to the left. I find that quite odd, just as it's quite odd talking to my laptop, which is what it feels like, um, because you're not answering the person who's asked the question. But anyway, he, he continued to try to say that, that it was all nonsense, and then he, after I'd sorted out which papers he needed to look at, research papers, he then said, uh, well... Uh, Strauss has shown that this analysis is wrong, and I was able to say, well, if you look back at the paper we've just looked at, you'll find that Strauss resiles from that position and agrees that what he's doing is an approximation to a log logistic accelerated life model, which I said looking directly at the judge, who didn't actually smile, but there was just the faintest twinkle in his eye, because the judge clearly knew I was saying to the barrister, you don't want to go down this line. I can explain this, but you won't understand the explanation. So, the, you know, the, the, the case settled with um, a reasonable estimate of life expectancy. In actual fact, in England and Wales for these cases, we no longer get called because they have what I think is a better approach for the NHS Litigation Authority, which is that there's a structured settlement. There's an agreement on the level of care needed and it's provided throughout life. On the other hand, if you're talking about road traffic accidents, the insurance company has to pay out, so you have to have an agreement of how much, how much say, it, it costs to care for an 18-year-old who's tetraplegic um, per year, and then how long she's likely to live. Um, that particular case, Agnes Collier, you could look it up if you wanted, it's uh, in the public domain, um, won the largest uh, settlement by that stage in the UK of 23 million because, in fact, in fact, she was a very bright young woman, was very likely to have a professional career and keep going. I suppose Stephen Hawking is the, the kind of person one might think of for that. So for life expectancy, you need to have some idea of what the data is and then how you're going to present that data to let people know what a reasonable life expectancy is. You, know, they, you have to accept the lawyers will probably then trade a bit about it. Um, but at least 
you know, we can actually look at evidence. Um, many years ago, Stephen Evans told me he heard a pediatrician doing the opposite of what this pediatrician was doing and saying, none of my patients are aged over 18. So I don't think this child's likely to live beyond, the, beyond that. And you're thinking, yes, but you're a pediatrician? So let's think about Vioxx. Um, and this was a case in Scotland. Now, these things do differ very substantially. Um, Ireland, I was called across at the last minute. I'd normally give evidence in advance. England and Wales, you can talk to people. Scotland, you don't have any communication with people on quotes the other side. Although you're supposed to be giving evidence for the court, not for a side. And with this, the claim was that the weight of scientific evidence supported the cardioprotective effect. So this was a case in which the drug had been shown to be associated with heart attacks and strokes, so your cardiovascular effects. And the claim that the company was making was that when there was a randomized controlled trial where the rate of heart attacks and strokes on Vioxx was higher than on the other drug, this was because the other drug was preventing um, these cardiac events, not that their drug was associated with an increase. And there was a lot of material. In fact, uh, a standard thing, if you think about it, to do, if somebody asks you for all the material about testing a drug, is to give it to them. Because if you give somebody a million pages, they're going to have a bit of a problem working out what's, what to look at. So I tend to request that the lawyers tell me what to focus on. Otherwise, the volume is just in, impossible. In this case, it was very clear to me, having read the, the statistical comments, that they were hoping to sort of essentially skip over issues by using verbal arguments like there was no thrombotic cardiovascular risk associated with Vioxx but they weren't giving the numbers, or the rates were similar. Whereas when you actually went and looked at that, you might have found quite substantially different rates and a, a p-value of, of 0.499 or something like that. Um, another problem was things like saying subsequent studies provided further evidence of a cardioprotective effect of something. Um, a second study found that X at 500 milligrams twice daily demonstrated a sustained antiplatelet effect indistinguishable from that of aspirin. Well, that sounds very nice, but then, of course, if you're uh, one of us cynical statistician types, of course, you go and look at the study. And you go and have a look, and you find it was a study on nine healthy volunteers for six days. But Vioxx is a drug, as are these other drugs, who are given to people who are in serious pain and who are very often elderly. For example, cancer patients. And you're not going to be taking them just for six days. So, firstly, that's an unrealistic comparison. But equally, if one goes and has a, a good look at the recommendations and the medicines, um, they change their names, probably European Medicines Agency, um, you'll find that if you're trying to show that uh, a drug is indistinguishable from another, they regard um, there is a minimum recommended sample size, which I think is 12 or 15, and even that's quite small. And clearly, um, when you say indistinguishable, this is our old favorite of saying, could you please tell me what the effect size is and the confidence interval, um, not just tell me it's not significant. Um, so in doing this kind of report, one of the things I had to do, um, which is fairly standard in, in Scotland and England and Wales, um, is I had to explain some of the basic statistics, like what is a standard error, what are summary statistics, what are significance levels, what are confidence intervals. Um, again, it's very important, and certainly on the criminal side, um, one of the things that's come out of Cambridge, trying to get people to think critically about the data they've got is one of the major challenges. You do tend to get um, a view which says, oh, it's a big data set, it must be good. And 
And Charlie Meng at the RSS conference in September, I don't know if any of you were there, gave a very nice talk which demonstrates um, how relatively small correlation in selection can make a massive difference to your um, the validity of your results. The other thing I had to do was do a reanalysis of a systematic review to focus on stroke. And again, this is part of the vagaries of, of getting involved and why I understand some people prefer not to get involved. Um, in order to bring the case, uh, one needed legal aid funding. And the Scottish Legal Aid Board chose to fund a case based on stroke, not on heart attack. There were about 200 cases in the background. Um, and, of course, the evidence for stroke was considerably less than for cardiovascular. And so I had to redo the analysis that was being relied on to show what the effects were for stroke. And Vioxx is no longer on the market. On the other hand, on page 5, I'm now going to talk a little bit about a drug that is still on the market, Vigabatrin, um, is the main point of this talk, it's an anti-epileptic drug, and this was a case in England. I put Wales in brackets because most of the law is the same in England and Wales, but I, I can't remember whether this actually included Wales. What was the problem? Well, Vigabatrin is a, an anti-epileptic drug that works well for people for whom almost no other drug has worked. It, it controls their seizures. But what happened is that there gradually became reports that people were losing their vision. Well, the reports initially were people being clumsy and bumping into things. So it took a bit of time before there was enough case series to start asking questions, and then more studies done. So what you get is evidence accumulating. And the question is, at what point should the company that owned the drug provide a warning to doctors and patients about this possible effect? So again, I got sent a lot of information and insisted on just looking at part of it. And the question then was, uh, what was the evidence? What was really odd was, in England and Wales now, if you write a report, um, and I knew Tony Johnson was on, on the other side, because I knew really it would be Tony Johnson, myself, and Paula Williamson, because of the, the work we did. Um, and I tried to avoid the case, but landed up uh, Paula Williamson declined, so it left it to Tony and myself. And your reports are exchanged, and you read the other person's report, and you ask questions. Well, it's clear that Tony and I were both going, we're not talking about the same case. That all came down to the evidence from the trials. And one side had left the S off. So Tony was, was talking about a single trial, and I was talking about all the evidence. Anyway, that got sorted out. Tony very kindly pointed out some of my um, minor arithmetical errors and so on. And then what happens after you've exchanged things, you are instructed to meet and agree a joint report. Um, so the first thing I did when we actually met was to thank Tony, Tony for all the very careful work he'd done. He put a lot of work into it. He's very knowledgeable in the area. And then you sit down and you talk about everything that you agree about. And then if you disagree, you have to specify that. So we were getting on fine, producing a nice report, and then a medic turned up, who'd also been instructed, and he kept interrupting, so we had to ask him to, to not interrupt, um, because it wasn't anything to do with his evidence. And then he, um, he did interrupt again to say, I've never seen such a peaceful, amicable meeting. However, he kept trying to push things one way, whereas Tony and I were saying, you know, this would count as evidence in of early warning this against and so on, doing it as statisticians for the court, not, not favouring one side or another. The report was written up, and then when it was being checked, um, I'd, I'd referred to a case control study that I knew about, and this particular medical doctor um, sent me an email uh, criticising that point and alleging um, I think that the, the data in the medical publication was false. So I dropped him an email saying, uh, you've just alleged professional misconduct of the lead author. Would you like to report it to the General Medical Council or shall I? 
Uh, the phone rang almost instantly with him apologising because, you know, he clearly uh, was hoping to get away with making allegations he couldn't substantiate and were not valid. And the case settled. Now, in this case, Vigibatrin is still on the market. Um, Paula Williamson and I were part of a team that did a, a meta-analysis. There is a strong dose response effect, um, an age effect. It does affect people's vision. But for epilepsy, it may be the only drug that works. So I understand that now patients may have to work through 16 pages of information before it can be decided that they can have the drugs. I was a bit surprised to hear that uh, in America it was being promoted as a drug for weight loss. I don't know whether the idea was that if you lost your vision you couldn't go and shop and buy lots of food, but it's not a drug I would use for, for weight loss, not with that kind of severe side effect. Um, the risk-benefit analysis is one thing for epilepsy, but not for weight loss. Anticoagulants. So, Sheila Bird and I were both instructed on different sides. Um, because somebody had said, you know, the hospital was at fault. If my patient had been given anticoagulants, they would have lived. Frankly, there's just no evidence. It's all over the place. And so not only did Sheila and I agree that, um, Sheila stirred me up to write a short article saying, look, this is the kind of evidence you need. These are the issues. There may not be things that are possible to understand. So as I say, I, I prefer England and Wales because you've got much more of a chance of talking directly to the experts. You're not getting, you know, in Ireland having a barrister asking you a technical question which you can give the answer to the judge, um, but you do depend on the judge. The other time I was in Dublin, there was a, a remarkably rude judge who was not interested in listening to evidence. Um, uh, and that, you know, that's uh, a bit of a concern if you're concerned about getting an accurate estimate. I did get involved in a General Medical Council misconduct case, and that actually counts as equivalent to criminal. So you don't get to find out who the people on the, the other side are. And I did land up with a lot of hostile cross-examining. Um, Although, ironically, um, I had been instructed by the GMC, who are, if you like, prosecuting, and my report meant they had to drop um, nine of the ten charges because it was a case about a randomized controlled trial of helping very premature babies to breathe, and most of the complaints were simply not valid. Um, it, it was actually a very well-designed trial. There was, there was one major mistakes that they made, which was to claim they could tell patients, parents, that their children were better off dead than alive. That's a part that was actually a very good study. So while this barrister was trying to bully me and suggest I was completely incompetent, every time I got a bit bored, I could say, so you thought I was incompetent when I got your clients let off the charges? And she'd have to back off. Um, again, that's not, not the kind of style that everybody would enjoy. Um, and again, as I say, that's more like criminal where you're much more likely to give evidence. I've probably provided reports in maybe 300 cases, and I've given evidence in court um, once in London, once in Dublin. I've sat in in Dublin, but I've, I've only given evidence once in Dublin. Never in Scotland, once in South Africa, and once in Australia. So that's five out of 300. It's not a, a high risk of appearing. So, what are the um, challenges for statisticians if they are going to carry out these reports? Well, the first challenge is going to be the numeracy of the lawyers. And I can't really speak very generally about this because I quite deliberately started in a specialist area um, just with cerebral palsy and then I've expanded a little bit. But um, on the whole, the majority of the barristers are pretty sharp. And when you sit down and explain the points to them, they can follow. Um, some of the solicitors are less confident. Any, any of you who've done statistical consulting may well be used to people saying, um, coming in and saying, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not very good at maths, I'm not very confident. 
my impression generally, um, comparing my experiences as a consultant to the medical um, profession and to statistics, uh, to, to the legal profession, is that on the whole the barristers are very sharp. I'd compare them to neurologists in, in medicine who I find are some of the most numerous and logical and, and happiest with abstract thinking. Um, the solicitors can can struggle, and as I say, one of the one of the big challenges is always people saying, um, "But they've got a very large data set in California, and you've got a much smaller data set." And having to explain that if you look at a data set and you find that the definitions of cerebral palsy are inconsistent, then it may be large but you can't be very confident that it's actually telling you about what you want to know. And, in fact, commented in the past on some definitions being inconsistent, the claim being a person has cerebral palsy if they have got um, a positive answer to three questions, and then you find that there's quite a lot of missing data on those three questions and no statement about how you handled that. The group in California have now uh, addressed this problem by simple expedient of not saying how much missing data they've got um, and saying very little. So in a spinal cord injury recently, they have used a paper, which they say is the best thing since sliced bread, but it's noticeable that it starts off with about 50,000 people who've had spinal cord injuries, but the analysis is only done on 30,000. And very, very little is said about the missing 40% of the data. Um, I responded by saying that uh, they really ought to provide the strobe guidelines. So those of you who, who do medicine will know that increasingly in medicine, there are guidelines for reporting for different kinds of studies, um, consult for clinical trials and so on, which require you to specify the populations and the, the dropout, where the dropout goes and the impact of missing data. Uh, when, I, when I suggested they do this, um, a letter came back saying in great indignation that it was outrageous to ask for this and that the person writing back had never been asked for such a thing in his life. Well, it was slightly unfortunate that he was co-author um, on a paper which I'd refereed in which that questionnaire, that stroke guideline, had had to be filled in. So when I pointed that out in reply, I got a slightly different response. But actually the case settled. So I was still not sure what was happening in that. I mean, it has been quite interesting because there are really two groups who do this, myself in the UK and a group in California. And it's really quite funny because you can see the reactions over the period of 20, 25 years coming out of each of us reading the other people's reports all the time. Um, so numeracy of lawyers is a bit of a challenge, certainly for a case I'm involved in at the moment. I'm going to have to write quite a lot of explanations about um, competing risks models and missing data and so on, which I'm not sure I'm entirely enthusiastic about. It'll, it'll be an interesting challenge. You, have to, you do have to be keen to communicate effectively, I think, um, or it, it's not a, a good job to land yourself with. Property and a witness. Now, this is... This is something you get in Scotland and in South Africa. So in Scotland, I had provided a report for one side, and I was approached by the other side, call them B, and A said, oh, the other, you know, side B's approached you, you're not allowed to talk to them. To which I replied saying, look, I wrote a report for the court, not for you. And if you don't trust my professional ability to write a report for the court, don't instruct me in the first place. Um, so they got a bit embarrassed, side A, because what side A had done was picked a report from me and the Californians. That basically means they tied up the people in the world who would do this kind of report, which meant that side B couldn't get anybody. And then side A decided to release the report by the other person. So at that point, I was allowed to talk to the other side about the report that had been released, with a solicitor from side A there, um, and I think I've communicated fairly effectively because that's the last time 
um, I'm aware of that game being played, of instructing both sides and releasing only one report. As I say, in England and Wales, there is no property in a witness. Although solicitors will behave as though there is, there is nothing to stop you in England and Wales or Australia giving expert evidence on the basis of information you've been provided. Clearly, you can't take confidential information and disclose it. And that does mean that that's why it's very unlikely um, for most routine cases to get to a court in, um, in England. In Northern Ireland, I think this has changed. I'd be curious if any of you know anything about it. Um, I once went with uh, my colleague Peter Farrow, flew over to Belfast, and spent the day sitting on benches like, um, you know, school gym benches, no backs, in the foyer to the court because the barristers and solicitors were only prepared to start negotiating once we were actually there. We never gave evidence. Complete waste of time. Um, I don't know whether Northern Ireland has improved things since then. One of your other challenges may be too, either too little information um, or just possibly too little knowledge of where to go. I mean, it, informally on the case that I'm looking at at the moment. I've chatted to quite a number of people. Um, I'm using data from the National Joint Registers on hip replacements, which you can all see. That's in the public domain. But talking to people is quite useful. They often throw up extra ideas. Um, but if there's too little information and poor quality data, and you say there's too little information, there's poor quality data, you don't get a gold star. People don't like being told that. Um, but I think I've established a reputation for saying, um, you know, for giving an honest report regardless of which side has asked me. As I said, the other game is very much too much information. Um, Vigabatron, um, Vioxx, vast amounts of in information. Um, with Vigabatron, I think I read it, some of the analyses. I did that for the GMC case as well. And also, um, you know, the case I'm involved in at the moment, um, the solicitor cheerfully said, what about a literature review? And other statisticians involved said, well, actually, we can find several hundred, if not thousand, references. There is no way we can turn this around in the timescales available. And in fact, I'm, you know, I would reckon you're, you're talking about a two to three year research project at least. In fact, I hope quite likely I'll try to get a research paper or two out of it. So if there's too much information, um, I resort to being very clear about what I can and cannot do, what I have and have not looked at, and um, you know, simply declare, I have not had the time to look at this, I have no comment on this, if additional information comes up, my opinion might change. That sort of phrase, if there is additional information, this opinion may need to be revised, is, is obviously very important. Then what I've called weaseling, which is where, with Viox, um, it was clear they were not providing information. And I mean, I've, I happen to be quite interested in what's not there or missing data. But very often, that, that's what you can bring as a statistician, is that critical eye where you can look at things and think, there's something you're not telling me here. I'm going to ask you about it. Um, you know, pretending that um, you can dismiss any difference um, as not being no difference and being indistinguishable by simple expedient of not looking for evidence, and so on. Um, in terms of, of legal aid fees, um, England and Wales legal aid has, has pretty much dried up. Um, so those cases are, are not likely to be appearing. I, I think if I, I looked, I don't actually tend to be interested in which side has instructed me and who's paying. Um, because my focus is on the report for the court. Um, but I think if you looked at it, you'd find the work has, has dropped very dramatically. And that means quite a lot of the cases are road traffic accidents, industrial accidents. In terms of what you should charge, um, different universities would have different views. Um, I think Warwick now asks me to charge £400 an hour. Um, for that Dublin case I mentioned, I was still charging £300 an hour, except, of course, at short notice. So if you ask me something on Thursday and I've got to be in court on Tuesday, less than a week later, I double the fees. Um, at the stage at which I'm charging £600 an hour, 
I do actually record the time I spend very accurately down to the minute. Um, and I, I personally tend to slightly round down, and I don't include the fact that when I'm swimming and cycling, I'm often thinking about the cases. Um, but there's certainly, you know, if you're interested in the financial side, there is probably quite a bit of scope for more people to get paid doing these work. What are the advantages for statisticians? Well, you'll notice the first point is the same as my previous one, the numerity of the lawyers. As I say, by the time you get to the major cases, the top barristers, most of them are, are pretty sharp. The fact that in England and Australia, there's no property in the witness, that the, the focus is very much on getting a good outcome and trying to avoid unhelpful adversarial responses is important. So coming up with joint statements of agreement and disagreement I find very valuable. I mean, there are points when you still disagree, um, but there's no harm in, in having to be very clear and precise as to why you disagree. I think the fact that you really have to go to court is actually very important. Um, Warwick Statistics and indeed Warwick University are pretty tolerant of my activities for the moment. Um, but I think if I was constantly cancelling lectures and diving off to court, uh, they would be pretty miffed. Whereas, as it is, I don't actually... I usually make a note somewhere of the court dates. Um, but quite often, like when I was in Switzerland, I got an email... A, 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 a text, in fact, going, we just wanted to tell you you're not needed in Edinburgh tomorrow morning. And I'm going, oops, I rather assumed I wasn't because I hadn't, hadn't planned to get there. Um, but that's fairly common. And the insurance companies tend not to have a problem with, with providing um, money to pay the fees. So if, you, if you're involved in road traffic accidents, which, which is both sides or industrial, you will tend to not have too much of a problem. I work through the university. Um, I don't particularly argue too much about the overhead. I think they take a 40% overhead um, because it, it saves me the hassle of chasing up lawyers, sorting out contracts, getting money out of people, which reminds me I've got to sort out a, a case from Ireland. I have on occasion when somebody was explaining why it was very difficult to raise a cheque or something, I, I will occasionally say, well, that's a pity because you've asked me something else and I can't possibly answer until you've paid. It's, it's amazing how quickly payment can be sorted out in those cases. Um, but I'm afraid I, I, I've had a number of lawyers who've tried to play silly games and not pay their bills, which is why I'm quite happy to let the university sort out the, um, that side of it. Of course, the Royal Statistical Society does have advice on professional indemnity insurance as well, if you were doing these sorts of things independently. So what would I say in conclusion? We can really contribute a lot by finding evidence relevant to the particular case, evaluating it, and presenting the information. I'm getting increasingly asked about a lot of other life expectancy issues, and indeed about um, other issues where there's possible medical negligence. Um, there's also other kinds of civil lit litigation, such as discrimination cases. Joe Gastworth has done a lot of work of that in the U.S. Uh, I don't think statisticians have been as much involved in the U.K. Um, but other kinds of personal, personal injury cases, there would be plenty of scope. Obviously, there'd also be things in fraud and finance, which I don't work in, David Hand does. Um, but you might be interested in. And I think this does, also, of course, make me think of uh, when I taught the graduate intake medical students at Warwick, where I, I pointed out to them that although they were sitting there and being told by most of uh, the lecturers that they were inexperienced and didn't know what to do, as far as I was concerned, they were graduates in biological science, and they were experts. They knew a lot more than I did. And if you're worried about getting involved in a civil case, don't underestimate the value of simple statistics. Just explaining the data and data collection clearly and carefully can be very, very valuable for some of these cases and help people to understand whether or not there is really a case, whether there is a problem. 
Um, as I say, if you if you enjoy teaching, you would probably also quite enjoy this because you do need to be careful and patient in explaining the concepts. Try to think of good examples that will help people to understand a biased data set. You know, if the students who are coming to my lecture all say my lectures are useful, I can't I can't claim that 100% of people think I'm a good lecturer if I find out that only 10% of the students who ought to be there are there. That sort of thing. Um, I would say be very specific about what you will read um, and get good at weightlifting. Actually, I, I've got good at working online because of the volume. Um, be generous in the estimates of time needed. People will often say, what do you charge? How long do you think it will take? Or what do you charge for a report? If it's something new to me, I'll often say, this is my hourly rate but I strongly recommend you allow me to do two to three hours preliminary work before I give you an estimate of how long this will take because it can be very difficult to predict. And I find that some of the routine cases I'm getting quicker, so I'll, my contract will say uh, I advise you to allow three to four hours, but I may in fact be able to do the report in two hours and then I just charge for two hours. Um, if you're dealing with Scottish Legal Aid Board, Everything has to be approved in advance. So uh, on the occasions when I feel hyper-efficient and do the work in advance, I can land up finding that uh, they object to paying. Um, I tend not to log short phone calls of explanations. If I land up in long telephone conference calls, um, then obviously I will log that. Um, but again, there's sort of a bit of discretion as to just how miserly or, or how generous you are with your time. And I really would be pleased if more people would consider getting involved in, in the civil litigation side of things. If you're interested, I'd be happy if you, you know, dropped me an email. Um, I've, I've had three or four colleagues who've done reports with me. And, um, you know, I, I'm keen to get people to have the confidence to do the reports for themselves because I think... As a profession, as statisticians, we need to be contributing. That doesn't mean everybody has to do everything, but I think it would be very useful to our societies if a few more of us were able to contribute um, our expertise, our knowledge, uh, in order to try to reach a fair settlement, a settlement that's fair to both sides um, of disputes. And particularly something like um, the cases with adverse effect of drugs, of course, you're not only addressing the needs of the patients who've already taken the drug, but of course you're also helping to clarify things for future patients who may have to weigh up the risks and benefits for themselves. Uh, hi, Jane. Um, my name's John Moriarty. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, uh, you reminded me of a, a little bit of research I did a couple of years ago on the role of... Um, clinical psychologist in the legal process and I know so you're you in for the purpose of this talk you were talking as a statistician but you're obviously also a medical epidemiologist with an interest in epilepsy so I was wondering if you were approached to talk about a, co a, a case involving a subject matter that you ha were intimately acquainted with would you recuse yourself from giving statistical advice on the basis that you might have seen data that haven't been published or peer-reviewed and that you might have a you know, a broader sense of the epilepsy literature, and you, you, like you could speak to it as a as an epidemiologist. But may, you, 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 you de would you decline from speaking to it as a statistician? I guess my question. Oh gosh, that's, I mean that's a very good question. I've never I've never actually done it that way. I mean, I suppose I haven't actually thought of it that way, and I'll have to think about it. I suppose I would more take the view that um, because everything has to go down in writing. You can, say, you can see exactly what you've relied on and what you're saying you relied on. Obviously, some of that is, some of what you're being asked for is your sort of general expertise. Um, and that comes from a lot of experience. So I, I don't think I would feel I had any confidential data in the sense of information that was illegitimate. I mean, if I say had done some research or somebody had shown me some research in confidence um, 
that I couldn't I couldn't refer to. I wouldn't refer to it. Uh, um, I guess the most I could think of is somebody had so shown me something about, um, say, um, something that led me to realize that there was an important variable with cerebral palsy that um, I wasn't, um, I hadn't taken into account and I was worried about it. If I couldn't find it mentioned in any publication that was in the public domain, then I guess I would feel a bit reserved about quoting a particular thing. I mean, like Botox comes to mind, although I really don't know whether it's important or not. Um, so if I found that other people had raised the question in public about Botox, I might say, this question has been raised, I don't know anything about it. If nobody had raised the question, I would probably restrict myself to saying, there may be other factors um, of which I am not aware, which have not been put in the public domain. Um, but you, yes, I'll have to carry on thinking about that one. Good question. I, I'm more likely to decline either because I'm too busy or it's not my area. Hi, Jane. Do Hi, Gilbert. Yeah. Uh, I don't have as much experience of this uh, as you, but you asked about Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Northern Ireland still is very adversarial. And mm -hmm. uh, my impression, I, I worked in uh, several cases, uh, uh, some, uh, some criminal and, and, and some civil, and my, my view of it is that they seem to be more interested in winning the case than interested in the scientific <laughs> evidence. And, and that applies to both sides. So I was very pleased with your description of things in England where you, uh, I'm sure, avoid these uh, terribly turgid sessions in, in court where yeah. the barrister nor the judge nor, nor anyone else in the court can sometimes understand the technical, uh, technical argument. So that seems like a very good idea in England. Could you say a bit more about it? So if you, if you want to look up a little bit of the background, um, it came in under Lord Justice Wolf, I think it's W-O-O-L-F, and essentially it was um, in response, I think, to escalating costs and to judges getting very bored by exactly the thing you're saying. And essentially he stepped back and said, what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve justice. What is the role of a judge? The role of the judge is only to look at, adjudicate where there is disagreement. And so I really do not want to be in court having both sides telling me exactly the same thing that they agree on. So, so basically the, the judges have been given much more authority to instruct experts to outline where they agree and disagree. In fact, it's gone further. So this, this case that I'm involved in, I'm not sure exactly what the, the public status is, but there certainly is stuff, plenty of publications about metal on metal hips, so I can tell you it's about that. And in this case, the, the, the judge has gone one step further. Um, not only will, I'm done as an epidemiologist and somebody from the state is done as a statistician. The judge has instructed the, the epidemiologist so the three of us, two from the defendants, one from the, sorry, one from defendant, two from claimants, we've actually been instructed to have a meeting by the 27th of January where we're not allowed to discuss results, but we, we must discuss the questions that will be addressed so that we can't have the stage where we land up producing expert reports which don't even intersect. Um, so, so that's very good. I must confess, I've always meant to write to the Senior Lord Justice in Scotland and say, look, I clearly wasn't intended that you could tie up all the witnesses, one side can tie up all the witnesses, but that is a position, and I don't think that experts, um, I think it's disrespectful to suggest that an expert cannot be trusted to give an expert report. There's another, uh, uh, you mentioned the idea of estimating uh, the expectation of life or, or likely, uh, likely survival time. Now, 
even though you know you have uh, uh, standard uh, clinical life table methods that uh, most people could agree on uh, for for averages and things like that. I mean, we know working in survival analysis that uh, estimating survival time uh, accurately for an individual is something incredibly difficult. Yeah. That's why, as I say, I'm very happy that in England and Wales, for the medical legal, the cerebral palsy cases, that effectively it's now done in what's called a structured settlement, and they're coming in a bit more in, in, in England, I think, even in the outside of the NHS, which is essentially, what is the level of care, and we will provide it for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, but other jurisdictions uh, are not prepared to consider that. And so, you and I both know that um, giving the estimate we give is, is almost certain to be quite badly wrong, but on average, it's the best answer we can give. Yeah. And I, I, you know, um, un unless unless you've got a, a slightly different way of doing things, or indeed if our pension fund chooses to pick up more of these cases, which I discovered they do as investments, um, then, uh, you know, and, and run it more as a, as a broader brush insurance for the, these very high value cases, you're going, to get, you're going to continue with that. I should also mention, by the way, that Australia, um, and I think the US are a bit different, in that any communication by email can be revealed. So I have had sarky remarks from my opposite number when I've been told there was a, you know, an informal discussion coming up. I've sent off a draft report by email saying I haven't had time to proofread this yet. And then I get comments coming back later saying I noticed this typo in the draft report and that and that. So clearly everything is disclosed, which um, is just worth bearing in mind if you... Um, I mean, the, the opposite number don't mind... Uh, slandering me and, and uh, calling me all sorts of names, but I, I try not to reciprocate, even when I don't think it's going to be, uh, the email's going to be copied to them. Yeah, sure. So, uh, anyway, thank you, Jane. And I, I must say, your talk was uh, exceptionally clear, uh, so don't worry, don't worry about the presentation. It was great. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gilbert. Any other questions? Yeah, Hi, uh, Maria North from the Northern Ireland Clinical Trials Unit. I wonder, Jane, if you'd uh, ever been consulted as an expert in any cases uh, arising from challenges in advertising standards, and if so, did they differ in tone? Uh, no, I haven't. I mean, basically, um, I, I mean, technically drugs are about licensed to advertise, but it's not really the same thing. I haven't, but then I've essentially never advertised because of the volume of work. Um, I would imagine that if you did that, you know, if a statistician picked that up, I mean, you can to some extent determine the tone. I mean, I think, I'm pretty sure amongst the sort of medical negligence community, uh, I'm known for being very direct, but also not swayed from one side to another particularly. You know, I, I'll answer the question. So I've tried to maintain the tone, even when I have had some really pretty, sarcastic, spiteful uh, written comments about myself. So you will, you may well find that, but I think the answer is you you decide what tone you're going to take, um, and you may need a, a fairly thick skin um, if people are going to be rude to you but you don't have to reciprocate in the same vein. Yeah. 